have uh, Professor Alexei Borodin from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and uh, Alexei is working on interface of representation theory and probability theory with links to combinatorics and uh, integrable systems, random matrices. And he contributed uh, with fundamental results uh, to various areas, sub areas of integrable, integrable systems, and I could mention a string of impressive works with uh, uh, Olshansky, Okunkov, other people, Bike, and others. And recently, he is exploring and creating new area of uh, algebraic, uh, algebraic structures, which answer some very difficult probabilistic and physics questions. In particular, he is known for introduction of ideas which led to invention of McDonald's process and application to KPZ theory. And uh, Alexei comes from great uh, Moscow Russian school of, of mathematics. He was born in uh, Donetsk in Ukraine, studied in Moscow and Pen Pen University of Pennsylvania, and uh, hold uh, numerous uh, prestigious awards like uh, long-term uh, Clay Institute Fellow, uh, Award of Moscow Mathematical Society, and he was invited speaker at the International Congress of Human Mathematicians in 2010. So yeah, it's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Vladas, for a very flattering introduction. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. It's a great honor for me. And uh, um, I'm going to, so my talk, as, as you see, is titled Integrable Probability. And the first thing I'm going to do is to try to explain these words. So these are not typical words. This is not a, a, a well-known term. And to do that, I'll use a fairly simple example. Now imagine that, that we are playing a game that, that kids like to play, namely building a tower of blocks. You have standard blocks that, that um, go on top of each other. They are supplied at random times and just put one on top of the other. And the question you're asking is, what is going to be the height of this tower after some large time period t? So if the, the blocks come uniformly, reasonably, homogeneously in time, then it's obvious that in the first approximation, the height will grow linearly. There will be some average speed of growth, so that's speed times time, but then there will be fluctuations. The fluctuations are random, and we would like to understand something about them. Now, everybody in the audience will tell me that oh, this is known. Imagine you don't know anything. How would you approach the problem? So probably you would want to start with an example. What's a reasonable example? So one reasonable example I, I would suggest is that let's imagine that the time is discrete, and every second you either have a block or you don't have a new block, but probability half. So you wait for a long time, and then you count, and the counting tells you that after a long time, you're going to have n blocks with this probability. So this is the so-called binomial distribution. This is a, the binomial coefficient. And this is the normalization constant. Right? So that exercise was done by um, Demoivre a long time ago, beginning of the 18th century. And he figured he can use his knowledge of factorials, or Stirling's formula in modern terms, to figure out that the height at large time deviates from the linear growth by something that has the size time raised to, to power one half. And the distribution of the deviation is the well-known bell-shaped curve. That's the Gaussian distribution. That was well ahead of his time. Laplace, almost 100 years later, rediscovered the result. And what, what, what good does it do to us? So it's an example. We can solve it. What next? It actually works well when coupled with something that I called here universality principle. Namely, the fluctuations should not be too different for different examples as long as these examples are similar in some sense. So this universality principle in this particular setting is known as the central limit theorem. It tells you that as long as the blocks come from reasonably, the distance between, the, the time distance between the new blocks come at, from a reasonable distribution and they're reasonably independent in time, then there will be a convergence to the bell-shaped curve with some model-dependent constants, which in this example are 
half and half, but they can be different. However, that central limit theorem was proven almost 200 years after the Moirev, 100 years after Laplace. There is a big gap of understanding between the first examples where you can do something and the actual universal statement that one can prove. So then, you would ask me, why did I dig this Stone Age example? The reason is that the idea that an integrable example predicts the universal behavior turns out actually to be quite fruitful if we try in this block model to raise the space dimension. So the pictures that I hear are three models of dropping blocks. So now my blocks um, have a space dimension. They, they form different vertical columns. The leftmost one has columns that do not in, uh, talk to each other. In each column, you just have the model that I started with. That's it. Now this model, so this is called random deposition. This, this is something more interesting. When the block drops down, it looks around and searches, let's say, in a neighborhood of size three for the lowest position. And that's where it lands. Okay? So it tries to fill the holes. And then the third one um, is the model of sticky blocks. When the block falls, it's going to stick to the first block it touches. It can be on the side, or it can be and goes down. Okay? So this is actual simulations. The, the color represents, let's say, first thousand blocks, and then a new thousand blocks, and so on. You see that, so here the fluctuations are really of size t to the half. That's the central limit theorem I started with. This is much smoother. And this is probably smoother than that and maybe rougher than that. Everybody can model this on a computer. And in a log-log scale, you immediately see that this is fluctuations of size t to the quarter, and this is fluctuations of size t to the third. And the equations that I wrote here are actually the equations written by a physicist on sort of very general grounds, something like Taylor expansion, to model the fluctuation growth. They usually write them as formal equations. I'm not going to do much to them. So eta here is the um, two-dimensional white noise. But um, I just wanted to explain the symbols, but I'm not going to go into that much. The point is, I'll, so I'll concentrate most on this example when, when we get t to the one-third fluctuations. I'll talk a little bit about the quarter one, which actually turns out to be simpler. Um, from the equation, it's actually visible. There is a nonlinear term here, and this is a linear equation in here. The point is, we have no idea how to prove this t to the third. Just no idea. Okay. You can modify the model a little bit within, within range. You model it, you see t to the one third. What is it? And then you want to know something more. You, you want to know the actual distribution of the deviation of the height, right? You normalize by t to the third the fluctuations. What is it? Well, of course, there is always a question of who cares. There are plenty of numerical uh, things we see. Why should we really spend time trying to investigate them? Well, one additional reason in this case is actually that this is uh, the phenomenon that um, one can see experimentally. And not only that, the experiment is something that most, most of us have done in our life in one way or the other. If you spill coffee on a countertop and you don't wipe out the stain, you let it dry, then the picture that you see will look like this. And the point in this picture that I want to emphasize is that there are dark rims on the stain. If you do the same with T, there will be no dark rims. Now, that is explained by the fact that coffee has particles floating around. This is, it's, it's a colloidal suspension. And when the water dries out, the convection flow actually pushes the particles to the pinned um, edge of the droplet. These are actual pictures from the experiment. So you see that the, the particles get accumulated here. Um, of course, this is not coffee. The particles need to be standard. Coffee has all sorts of particles. So these are specially manufactured particles. They're all identical. Um, and the interesting thing is that the, the, the fluctuations, the roughness of this edge here depends on what particles you take. If you take perfectly round particles, then the fluctuations end up to be of size t to the half, where t here actually is the thickness of this, of this layer that already accumulated. 
And if one takes slightly elongated particles with the aspect ratio something like 1.2, then the edge fluctuates as t to the one-third. And um, further investigation into st other statistical quantities re re reveals the similarity to the problem with sticky blocks. Okay? So that's something that um, well, one at least can be curious about. It's way beyond, as I said, it's way beyond what we can do to analyze the sticky block problem. However, there are integrable problems, like those with blocks that fall with probability half at each second, that we can analyze. And this is an example of such a model. It has a fancy name, totally asymmetric simple exclusion process, which nobody says. Everybody abbreviates it to TASEP. And the model is actually much simpler than its name. So the growing interface is now consisting of um, segments of slope one and minus one, of length one. And the way that it grows is the following. In each of the local minima of this interface, one puts a block, which again standard one by one blocks, independently for different minima. Let's say with exponential waiting time if we consider continuous time, or if the time is discrete, then in each block, uh, in each minimum, probability half each second there is a block, probability half there is no block. So this thing grows, and uh, um, I will actually make my computer, that's not the right picture, show how it grows. Um, well, before I do that, I wanted to say another thing, sorry. There is an interpretation of this model that relates to its name, and that is, is an interpretation of a simple model of cars on the freeway. So if I take my interface, and if I project it down on a lattice by the following rule, each segment of slope minus one will project to a particle, and each, slope of sl uh, if each segment of slope one will pro project to nothing, no particle. Then this is a one-by-one one, uh, correspondence between particle configurations in the lattice and interfaces of this sort. And in terms of particles, the evolution is as follows. Every particle has its own ring with exponential waiting time it rings, and it tries to jump by one to the right. If the spot is it's unoccupied, it jumps. If the spot is, occup is occupied, it doesn't. So the particles cannot sit on top of each other. Imagine cars going on the freeway, and then if you have a few empty spots in front, then with some probability you're gonna speed up and shorten that distance. Okay. It's an amazingly simple model that attracted a lot of attention. Um, there are probably at least a thousand papers written about this model. All right, so this is uh, supposed to be a simulation. I took a special initial condition with all the particles sitting on the left, so everybody's packed, or the interface is just a corner. And so this thing starts growing. And uh, so the starts on packing, and you see the corner is being filled with, uh, with um, one by one boxes. And then I probably want to speed up it a little bit, and then it quickly goes away, but I can catch it with, with the right scaling. And so then what you see really is that in the first approximation, this melted corner, so to say, looks like a, a smooth curve. It's actually a parabola that touches the, the two sides. And then you see also that there are smaller fluctuations. That in this case, as I'll, I'll, I'm about to state, will be of size t to the one-third, where t is the um, time that has passed. All right. So for this, work, for this model, one can actually prove things. So what can one prove? The first statement is the statement about the smooth curve. And that actually has been worked out quite well, starting from um, work more than 20 years ago. And it says that if we zoom out and look at the picture at the scale of large time, so the space and time are scaled in the same way, this is called hydrodynamic limit, then you don't see any randomness. You only see the profile that, that um, evolves according to a simple PDE, um, probably the simplest nonlinear PDE known as a shock equation or Berger's equation without the viscosity term. That equation is also uh, known to develop shocks, and those shocks are the traffic jams of the cars on the freeway. You know, with some initial conditions, sometimes you just get traffic jams, as we all know. 
Now, that is actually not the universal part of uh, TASEP. The universal part of TASEP is the fluctuations. And so for the fluctuations, the first result ever proven rigorously with t to the one-third fluctuations was by Kurt Johansson in 1999, and he proved the following. So let me take my TASEP. Let me start all the cars as in the simulation on the left. And let me run it for large time with all the known L. So this is my parabola. Um, and then there are some fluctuations. So if I zoom in around the parabola and scale the vertical axis by L to the one-third and the horizontal by L to the two-thirds, then it turns out that the fluctuations here will have a limit. So here is the statement. So the, the way I stated it here is just I took the vertical axis and measured the fluctuations on this vertical section, let's say, passing through the origin. Mm -hmm. So then I get the fluctuation distribution. It's a one-dimensional distribution. And you know, I guess for a fluctuation distribution, always should be it must be a normal distribution. Well, it's not. It's the first surprise. And the second surprise is that the distribution actually was already known due to a previous work by, um, by Tracy and Blitham, six years before the work of Johansson. And that distribution is now known as Tracy Whittem GUE distribution. So let me tell you how, how it came up. It came up from the study of random matrices. So random matrices were extremely successful um, in, in nuclear physics. They were brought into fashion by Eugene Wigner in the 50s, where he had this wonderful idea of modeling the nuclear resonances levels for, uh, for heavy nuclear by random matrix. So the logic was basically well, you know, these are eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian, which we just cannot possibly write down. It's too complicated, so let's just assume the Hamiltonian is random. He did that. He took certain measures on these random Hamiltonians, so large matrices, large matrices with real eigenvalues, with some symmetry, either real symmetric or emission. And then the, one of the good measures is actually a Gaussian measure on these matrices, um, it can be characterized by two properties. It's unitarily invariant. If you rotate the space, it stays the same. And also, the different matrix elements are statistically independent. If you impose these two things, well, except for those that are conjugate of each other, um, then there is only one example of such a measure. It's called the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And so Wigner says that the distribution between the eigenvalues in the bulk so the, the spectrum of this matrix will fill a segment. And if you go into the middle of that segment and you measure the distance between the neighbors, it's going to be distributed in some way. That distribution actually not. Well, that distribution matches something in, in nuclear physics experiments. Actually, I'm lying a little bit. What, uh, what matches the nuclear physics experiments is when the matrix is not emission, as I wrote here, but, but real symmetric. So that's a variation. It's called Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And it will appear on the next slide as well. But for unitary ensemble, one can play the same game. The unitary is actually a little simple. So Tracy Whittem, almost, almost uh, 40 years later, nobody cared about the, spec uh, the, the end of the spectrum. So, but they, they just thought, why not apply the same method? To the end of the spectrum, they took the maximal eigenvalue of that random matrix. And then you subtract the edge. You divide by the fluctuations. You get a distribution. So they described that distribution um, in a rather peculiar manner. It's hard to write an explicit formula for it, but one can describe it as a, as a solution. Well, it's, it's the square root of its second log derivative. is a solution of this seemingly simple looking second order dif differential equation. It's actually called pen level 2 equation. It has wonderful properties on its own. It's a nonlinear equation, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that aside. This is the origin of this distribution L of 2, or the first time that it appeared. And that's the same as this FGUE here. Two refers to the dimension of the complex field over reals. F1 is the same object if one starts with real symmetric matrices. There is also F4 when one starts with the Gaussian symplectic ensemble and even F beta with any beta. But um, I'm not going to go into that. So this was sort of a peculiarity to the random matrix community because who cares about the edge of the spectrum? Well, actually, um, as I showed, it turned out to be quite an important distribution. And here are some other results that one can prove for TASEP. 
So this is the one uh, that I already described. That's when all the cars start from the leftmost positions, right? Everything packed on the left. And that's when the corner is being melted into a parabola. So that, that leads to GUE. That's, that was the first result, and with t to the one-third fluctuation. If one start, starts with an asymptotically flat initial condition, so the interface is flat, or in terms of particles, that means that the uh, initial configuration is periodic. You have a particle to holes, particle to holes, and so on. Well, it turns out one can prove that as time goes by, the fluctuation, so the limit shape is trivial, right? The profile obviously is going to be a straight line because everything is translation invariant. And the fluctuations are going to be also of size t to the one-third. But the distribution of the fluctuations on each vertical section is not going to be the same as in, the, as in this case. It's actually going to be related to the edge of the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Well, one can also easily design something that will have a, a curved shape on one part of the space as a limit shape and the flat on the other. So this is a half-flat initial conditions. The particles alternate on half, half lattice and nothing on the other. And then it turns out that the curved part fluctuates as F2 and the flat part fluctuates as F1. And then um, um, there is some trans mesoscopic transition happening in the time. So what's going on? Is there really a universality? So the current understanding is that I've shown you all the examples that could, could possibly happen. Okay? So the understanding is that there is a certain universality class of models called Cardarpar as Yijong, universality class after three people who expressed the idea in, in 1986. If the global profile is flat, then on the flat pieces, the fluctuations are t to the one-third and f1. If the profile is curved, then it's t to the one-third and f2. But what's the class? So the class is expressed in sort of, in, 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 in sort of vague terms, but actually descriptive enough to decide for each model quite convincingly whether it's in the class or not. So there are three properties that can be, can be singled out. The first property is the locality of the growth. So if you have the interface, it's randomly growing. Distance par distant parts are supposed to grow independently of each other. They shouldn't feel each other. Okay? So it's like my box, boxes that fill the minima, if they are, well, they're all independent in my case. But in general, I just need them to be independent if they're far enough. The second property is a smoothing mechanism, which seems to be absent in, in TASEP, no smoothing. But what it really means is that I'm not um, allowed to have any fingers growing out of the interface. Any thing, lawn fingers are forbidden. No fractals can grow. And in TASEP, in this interface with slopes 1 and minus 1, this is enforced by the model from the very beginning. The fact that the slopes are bounded tells me that there are no sharp peaks and no, no deep holes. And then the third property is, is typically referred to as lateral growth, and that says that if you have a blob, then it's going to grow sideways. Literally, actually, what the, the way physicists use it is, is that the speed of growth, if you measure it vertically, depends on the slope of your profile at that location. So it's consistent because if the thing grows sideways, then uh, let's say the slope is very steep. If it's growing sideways, then the vertical part of the velocity will be small. And if the slope is like that, then the vertical part of the velocity will be large. So there is a slope dependence. Actually, if one removes the slope dependence, as is easy to do, then uh, the fluctuations stop being t to the one-third and then start being t to the quarter. And that's the middle column uh, that I showed before. That's actually a simpler case. It's, it's also called differently. It's called the Edwards-Wilkinson universality class as opposed to the KPZ class that I'm talking about. So um, since the first work of Johansson, there have been many more examples that, that, that were discovered. All of them are integrable in some sense, in the sense that one can actually write down exact formulas giving that thing or the other thing or something else and you can pass to the limit in those formulas. This is in spirit very much similar to the de Moivre Laplace central limit theorem. These are all examples of something like Bernoulli distributions, although much more advanced. 
Okay, so this is a list of things. Um, so the first, the first progress, um, the work by Johansson in the next 10 years, pretty much concentrated around the class of examples that are based on um, certain determinantal structures. They're known under the words determinantal point processes. Physicists would say free fermions. Uh, probabilists would say non-intersecting paths, and, and, and so on. Um, this is a list of models. I'm not going to go through them. I, I'll just probably mention one because it will come up later in my talk. This is called long range TASEP or push TASEP. And in terms of particles, the model is that each particle, again, tries to jump to the right independently of the others with exponential waiting time. But if the spot is occupied where it's supposed to jump, it just looks for the first empty spot and goes there. Okay? Turns out also to be a, a solvable model in the same universality class. It's called push asset because alternatively, if you don't keep order on the particles, that just means that this particle, if it wants to jump, is going to push over the two neighbors by, by, by one. So it's a, an impolite TASEP. Okay. Um, all right. So the, the progress of the last three, four years or so was actually that there is now a bunch of um, models that, one, that people can analyze exactly that are not determinantal. They're non-free free Fermion models. The, they, they came as a surprise, um, but they're still solvable. So the, there are many things that one can compute. And then, uh, again, I'll, I'll probably emphasize two examples. One is the KPZ equation itself. So the equation that, the, um, that physicists wrote as something that should model the fluctuations can be actually thought of as a member in the universality class. It's a little bit of a strange statement. KPZ equation is a member in the KPZ universality class. So the, the, the physicist's way of thinking was not quite correct, but all, almost correct. So it, it's just sort of another example. And then the second example that I, want, uh, that I will mention is ASEP. You see the difference from TASEP is that the first letter was dropped. And the first letter was the word totally. So that means that the, the cars that you have not only go to the right, they also go to the left. They jump left and right with different speeds. And they're being blocked on the left and on the right by the presence of the neighbors. Um, quite interestingly, if the, if the left and right speeds are equal, then that's a model in the Edward Wilkinson universality class. It's due to the quarter fluctuations. And if they're not equal, that's partially asymmetric case. That's another model of, of t to the one third. So a bunch of integrable things. We observe we have a good conjecture of what should happen to any model of the universality class. So far, no general approach as to do anything with a non-integrable case. OK. So um, the next thing that I want to do is to try to go even higher in dimension. So that will be more difficult. I will only stick to um, the surfaces that are built from one by one by one cubes, so standard cubes like that, with no uh, overhands. So something that, that's, that's pictured on the slide. Um, to illustrate how difficult this may be, this is, these are actually three pictures of the same surface from slightly different angle. It's not quite obvious when you see that. So the most obvious dynamics or a growth process that you can think for these things is to do what I did for TASEP, namely take one by one by one cubes and put them into every hole that I see independently, let's say, with probability half or something like that, right? That's a very natural thing. It's called heat bath dynamics or Glauber dynamics, depends on the taste of who's speaking. And there is literally nothing known about it, nothing. The only thing that is known is numerical simulations. So people would simulate. It's not going to go too far, actually, because this, to simulate this thing, you need a lot of space in, in, uh, in, in computer memory. So the, the numerical conclusion is that the fluctuations, are, so there will be a limit shape, which is a surface. And the fluctuations around that limit shape will be of size t to a power. And that power is, by simulation, 0.24. And they swear it's not one quarter. Okay. That's the state of the art in, in, in this heat bath situation. But um, there are still some integrable dynamics that grow these things. I'll get to them. But before, before going there, I'm, I'm going to show these pictures that are 
from earlier work, actually, that sort of indicate that there is certainly something going on that's interesting about these surfaces. So what are these pictures? This, let, let me tell you what the leftmost picture is. Imagine the corner of the room, not this room, the corner that looks like the Orton, right, with, with, with right angles. And you have these one by one by one cubes. Think of them as dust particles. And you're piling that dust into the corner. Let's say you have a million particles. And let's say, for some reason, the particles know about the uniform distribution. So you sample uniformly from all possibilities to pile a million cubes in the corner. Okay? When you do that, and you go away, you look into the corner of your room that you haven't really swept for a long time, then you see this shape. So the corner has melted. And this is actually here, uh, these algebraic curves that are easy to describe. Now this picture here um, is the picture of the same procedure with the room that has three corners. And so you also pile the, um, the, uh, the cubes, and then you see they fill the corners. But then they also merge together here in, a, in, a, in interesting ways. Um, it's not quite visible here. Th these will be, again, algebraic curves that will have um, cusps. And um, there's a formula that can describe that. And finally, this example is of the same nature, except for the boundary condition is, is more um, compact. So the, 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 uh, uh, the walls are not infinite. And then uh, you see that there is, so again, there is a uniform um, distribution on all possible ways to put one by one by one cube satisfying the boundary condition that here is simply in this projection is the border of that um, polygon. And then uh, you'll see that there will be sort of a frozen shape. And that frozen shape will be described by cardioid. Okay. And there are more examples of that sort. So this was th this beautiful algebraic geometric description um, um, was discovered in the, in the works of Okunkov and Reshetikin, and then uh, a little later by, by Kenyon and Okunkov, um, starting from 2001, but maybe 10 years ago was the period when they did that. So this is a static picture. I just took a million cubes and I put them somewhere. And the question that, that I'm going to ask is can we actually get this picture by growing them? So putting things one by one. Can actually see a growing interface that a large, at large time will look like, let's say, one of these, something like that. So I'm not going to give an answer right away. Instead, what I will do, I will show one example of a growth model in two plus one dimensions that's integrable. And then uh, I'll say that there are similar models that, that take care of the, of the pictures that, that were on the previous slide. So let me try to describe this, this evolution. So this will, this will be my initial condition. You know, imagine two planes that are at the right angle just, just stuck together. And the way I'm going to picture this thing is by this um, tiling picture. So this is a sector of the plane tiled with two rhombi. And I hope that your um, three-dimensional imagination um, can tell you that the, the one with the dots here is the vertical plane, and the one without dots is the horizontal plane. Okay. There is actually um, sort of a, a standard joke of the subject. Each picture like that can be interpreted in two different ways. And I'm sure if I didn't tell you how to interpret it, then the room, the room would be split into two parts. It's either this or that. But so for me, this is an empty corner. Okay. Now, the dynamics has two, two, post, two descriptions that I could give, one in terms of particles, which are the midpoints of these um, rhombi that are vertical. And the other one is in terms of the three-dimensional picture. I'll give both, but I'll start with particles. So here are the particles. I'm going to explain how these particles will start running to the right. So the first thing to do is to imagine that these particles have a hierarchy of their own. So with the guy that sits at the bottom is the big boss. He's not going to care about um, the particles on top. We're just going to, this particle is just going to do the random walk going to the right. So these two are not such, an important, such important bosses, but they're still more important than everybody above. Um, they're going to only observe the one below in some way, and, and so on. So there is this, this hierarchy. Okay. So then the dynamics looks like that. Every particle, independently of the others, tries to jump to the right by one. Sort of similar as what we had for, for, for TASEP. 
except for in order for this arrangement to make a legal picture, a picture of a surface without overhangs, the particles need to interlace. It's very easy to see. So the one on the bottom needs to be between these two on the top. And then each, each, of, the particle, each of the particles higher will always be between two particles, their neighbors at the next level up. So if you just allow your particles to run to the right, these interlacing constraints will be violated right away. That's not good. So you need a way of enforcing them. And the way of enforcing them is through this hierarchy of bosses. So if you, if you try to jump, and that will violate the interlacing constraint with your boss, with particle below, then you don't jump. And if it, and if it has something to do with the guy higher than you, then you just push the guy over. Okay, that's it. So let's see. So let's say this is, um, this is the first. So here the white dots are the particles that can potentially jump. These are n particles that are not blocked by their bosses below. You know, for example, this one is blocked here, and this one is blocked here. So let's assume this one jumps, and then it moves over by one. But then by interlacing, it has to push everybody in this rightmost line here by one as well. So that's the new configuration there. So here now these can jump as well. Let's say this one jumps, it pushes nobody, so it just goes to the right. And then if this one jump, it's going to push uh, the, the one guy on top and so on. So these things start moving over. Three-dimensionally, if you again take the point of view that this thing is an empty corner, what it means that instead of doing the model where, which I said nobody can do, where you just add one by one by one cubes in the corners, you add one by one by something sticks. Okay? So these sticks are all directed in one direction. You're not allowed to, to create any overhands, so you look at all possibilities to add sticks like this, 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 this. So for example, the first step here is putting this stick into the corner in, in this special way. So, and all these possibilities are independent and have exponential waiting times. That's the three-dimensional description of the model. It looks more complicated than one by one by one cubes. But there is a miracle of integrability. One can actually do things with this model. And I'll, I'll show which things. But before I, I show which things, I'll actually try to show uh, how this um, runs. Okay. So for some reason, um, the simulation is um, turned by 90 degrees, and, and there is also an affine transformation. But hopefully, you'll see what's going on. So you see, again, there are two possibilities to look at this. Either you have a full corner and you have um, columns that are being removed, or you have an empty corner and you have co columns that are being put in. But that's the dynamics that I'm talking about um, in three dimensions. So um, one can uh, speed it up. It goes a little faster. And I will actually speed it up quite a bit um, to see what really happens. Maybe a little more, uh, and I'll scale it down. Okay, so this is sort of a, um, well, this is what happened. And so by looking at this picture, it's quite natural to, to, to assume that in the first approximation, there is again a smooth limit shape, right? So this, this object here, the surface is approximating something smooth. That ends up being correct. Um, let me go back to my slides, but before going there, I will notice the connection to the um, more to, to tussle. What's the connection to tussle? If I just concentrate on the leftmost particles here, see these particles are not being pushed by anybody, but they're being blocked by their neighbors on the right. If you take that line, if you put it back down, this is going to be exactly tussle. So the projection of the system on the leftmost particles is tacit. If you looked at the particles which are the rightmost particles, they are not being blocked by anyone, but they push. And so the projection to the rightmost thing is push ASAP or long range TACIP that I defined before. There is a less trivial projection that I will still state. And if you look at the particles that are located in a fixed row, it turns out that their evolution is also Markovian. 
And it's very similar to the so-called Dyson Brownian motion on random matrices. So remember I had random matrices. On them, I had a Gaussian measure. That Gaussian measure can be viewed as a stationary measure for a Gaussian process. And then the eigenvalues will start evolving. And the diffusion limit of the evolution here on, the, on each fixed row is the same as that random matrix evolution. So that sort of starts explaining the surprise. The first, when, the, when Johansson proved his result, it was a lot of surprise because it was totally unobvious why the, these growth models should have anything to do with random matrices. We understand better now, and I'll come back to that question, but I just wanted to, to, to say that this picture, what probabilists would say, give a coupling. So everything is realized in the same two-dimensional model. The philosophy is the two-dimensional model somehow has much more information that, that, um, that, that was visible when you just look at the one-dimensional model. The structure only exhibits itself when you go in one dimension. Okay, okay. so coming back to these pictures um, um, of, of um, limit shapes, it turns out that there is a very similar dynamics that can be used to build, um, well, for example, what was drawn here, um, these cubes piled in the corner of the room with... Um, well, in three corners of the room, in the room with, with, with three corners. And the way that dynamics works, it increases the support. So you first fill this corner, so the, the projection of your cubes um, is shaded here, and then it sort of proliferates um, further and further, and, and um, it actually does the job. So that, that those, those surfaces that I showed, they, they get grown by, by dynamics. It's similar in spirit to what I showed, except for one needs to tune it to take care of the, of the random, of the boundary here that, that you can take um, actually anything um, there. Okay. Now, I, I said that I am after integrable models. I am after models for which I can prove something. So what can I actually prove for this column deposition model, for this model where the columns are being put into my picture? Quite a bit, it turns out. So for a for, for a set of initial conditions, indeed, if you take the hydrodynamic limit, so the space and the time are scaled in the same way, then there will be a non-random limit surface. So in the first approximation, this, this surface is, is just something smooth. And it grows, so remember that was the shock equation for TASEP. In this case, it also goes according to a, a first order um, PD. It's non-linear, but it's first order. It can be solved by characteristics. And um, so this F here is explicit. And so, so what's the PDE? The speed of growth, if you imagine that your interface is a plot of some function H that depends on time and two space dimensions, then the, uh, um, the speed of growth at a location only depends on the local slope of the tangent plane at the point where you're sitting. So it's the, the, the speed of growth really depends on the, on the slope in the first approximation. What about the universality class? So I said so much about the, um, the lack of knowledge about the one model that I started with, the one by one by one cubes, the heat bath. Now I'm telling you there is a model that, that I can solve. They are in different universality classes. Too bad. What, ter what, what, what turns out is that the, the, um, this, this KPZ universality class in dimension two splits into two subclasses. Because, because quadratic forms in dimension two have an invariant. The quadratic form can have a plus plus, a plus minus uh, signature. And this is a plus minus case. Because, so our, our space dimensions are very different. In one of them there is pushing, in the other one there is blocking. So that actually causes the signature to be plus and minus here. This equation that's written here is actually purely formal. I, I don't think anybody knows how to to, to make uh, mathematical sense of this equation. But that doesn't prevent physicists from writing it out. As I said, the procedure of writing it out is by essentially Taylor expanding um, something like that. Okay, and um, okay. So what about the fluctuations? Because the fluctuations, are, okay, so we are not in the universality class that we obviously wanted to get, but we're still in the, in the universality class, hopefully. Right? What about the fluctuations? So it turns out that if you pierce this picture by a needle and you measure the fluctuations between the surface and the, the limit shape and the actual surface, then the fluctuations there are not going to be algebraic in time. They're going to be much smaller. They're going to be logarithmic in time. That 
to me quite miraculously was predicted by a physicist in, in, in 91 who took this equation that makes no sense and did some sort of a one loop renormalization argument on it and figured out that there are no stationary points if the nonlinearity here is present. And then he said, fine, then the fluctuation should be the same as in the linear case, so just kill this nonlinear term here, and then Fourier transform solves it. It's logarithmic fluctuations, done. Okay. I was not in the community, certainly, at that time, but what, what, um, what my friends tell me is that, is that that was a big surprise. And that was certainly not predicted by simulations at that time, that this is actually not algebraic, that this is logarithmic. And indeed, it is. Okay, now to the more interesting question. What about different points? What if I take different points here, and, um, and uh, I want to know how the fluctuations at different points are distributed? So the single, the single point fluctuations, not only they're, Gau they're, they're logarithmic, they're also Gaussian. If one divides by the log, one just sees the standard normal variance. Now, in the, in the TASEP situation, let me try to, to locate it here. See, um, I had to scale this window in the horizontal direction as well. So what that means is that the fluctuations really are um, locally dependent. So if I, have a, if I have a point and I want to understand how my fluctuations at this point are correlated to that point, then the distance I need to travel between these points is t to the power two-thirds, which is strictly less than t, which is the linear size of the picture, the picture of the global limit shape. So I'm really sitting at a single point of the limit shape, and that's where things happen. Okay. It's going to be different in this case. Here, the dependence of fluctuations is actually global. There is a whole field of fluctuations around the limit shape over there. And that field, what's that field? This is the field. So um, it's the same column deposition except for drawn uh, from a different angle. And what I did here, so this is the simulation, and I subtracted the smooth limit shape. That's what you see as a fluctuation. And it's pretty terrible. And this certainly should not be any function that you see there. It fluctuates too badly. Now, I didn't scale this picture. What I said before is that if I scale each individual peak by log, then it's going to be normal. But this is not a scaled thing. And this whole thing together, together is an object. Now, that object is well-known in physics literature, getting to be well-known in math literature as well. It's called the Gaussian free field, or a massless field, free field in, in, in the physics literature. This is a random, random generalized function. It has no value at the point, as we see. But it has, val it has values when it's averaged against anything decent, okay? even actually averaged along the curve. So what's this Gaussian free field? The Gaussian free field is a conformally invariant object. Another fast-growing application of it in mathematics and probability is actually SLEs. And many properties of SLEs are now in the hands of um, um, Scott Sheffield and, and um, Jason Miller are being extracted from the Gaussian free field. But the definition is easy to give. So what's the definition? I'll give the definition on the, on the, upper, on the upper half plane as being my basic um, complex domain. There is an, a non-obvious um, identification of the limit shape, so this thing here, and the upper half plane. You only see the conformal invariance once you put the correct conformal coordinate on the limit shape. It's not visible. Kenyon was the first person to identify the way one puts it there. Okay, so once I do that, I am on the upper half plane, so I consider the Laplacian on the upper half plane with Dirichlet boundary conditions. These are the eigenfunctions, these are the eigenvalues, and these are the independent, identically distributed standard Gaussian. This is a random series in eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. If you do that in dimension one, you're going to see the Brownian bridge. If you do that in dimension two, at every point the series diverges. But if you average it, as I said, about, uh, against anything decent, you're going to get a convergent series that will produce a normal random variable and the, with the variance that is essentially the Dirichlet form on, on, on the domain. It's sort of the, the probably the best analog of the, of the Brownian motion or the Brownian bridge in, in, in two dimensions. So what's the lesson? The lesson is that by certain computations, about which I'm comment, 
I will comment in a second. In this column deposition model, we observe that the fluctuation field is the Gaussian free field in the correct coordinate. By universality, that should mean that in any model in the anisotropic KPZ universality class, the fluctuation field should be the Gaussian free field in the correct coordinate. And to the extent that we can so far see, this is correct. In the models that, that, that we were able to analyze, that ends up being correct. And I guess the, the sort of the high point here is that that Gaussian free field was not really predicted by, by, by physicists. So the first bit of information of how that field should look like came from one integrable example. Okay. It's sort of the situation of the de of Laplace theorem. Okay. All right. So now uh, I, I have a little bit, a few couple of minutes left. I just want to say how, so, so far this was mostly show office. I just showed the models and the pictures and, and the results. What, what goes in the analysis? How does one get there? It turns out that the analysis of these models is largely algebraic. Even though this looks like probability or analysis so far, what we are able to do is quite algebraic. The analysis comes into the last stage. The algebra in the end provides a formula for which one can do the analysis and that analysis is, is very uh, classical. It's something like steepest descent or Laplace method from, 11th, uh, from 19th century, how to do the analysis on contour integrals or something like that. So the hierarchy of these solvable models, I, I showed a few of these integrable models, it actually shadows <clears throat> another hierarchy. It shadows the hierarchy of multivariate special functions. Now, special functions are no longer considered as a domain of mathematics, but representation theory is. Representation theory is served by special functions, by characters, by spherical functions, by zonal spherical fun functions, and things like that. So for various groups, for classical Lie groups, for groups over finite fields, there are these wonderful functions that come up there that have all sorts of properties. They are orthogonal with respect to nice products. They have nice branching rules. If you kill one variable, they decompose onto the smaller basis. There is a formula. This is all parallel to the, to the representation theory, pretty much. And so essentially what, to me, this subject is about is that algebra. So this is the hierarchy that, that, that I mentioned. The, the top object here is called McDonald processes. The name is after McDonald polynomials discovered by Ian McDonald in, in the 80s, a remarkable two-dimensional, um, two-parameter family of, multi, of multivariate polynomials that generalize families that have been don't, known for a while. So sure processes or sure functions here come from sure the year of 1900 representation theory of symmetric groups and, and unitary groups. This here um, are whole little wood functions. They're related, to, this is from 60s, they're related from representations of piadic and, and uh, from piadic groups and, and Lie groups over finite fields. There are Jack polynomials sitting here and also random matrix theory sort of on top of them. Jack polynomials are also from the 60s. They are eigenfunctions of so-called Calgero Sutherland integrable system. There are Whitaker functions sitting here. They are um, of use in number theory and they arise in representation theory of GLNR. And so this is sort of what, what McDonald did. He united all these different examples into a single hierarchy. It's a wonderful development. The, the theory of McDonald polynomials and um, the double affine Heck algebras are sometimes referred to as Cherodnik algebras this day, these days is a hot topic in representation theory. So essentially, to me, the subject is about building a bridge between this picture, the picture, the representation theoretic picture, and the probabilistic one, and trying to push certain non-trivial structures through that bridge. It so happens that on the, well, if you, if you cross it in the, you can cross it, and the bridge can be crossed in both directions. If you cross it into, into representation theoretic direction. This is called asymptotic representation theory that has been developing since, since the 70s. If you cross it in the, so the, the cross in the other direction is more recent, that's what I'm talking about. And if you do it that way, then uh, there are things that come out that, 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 that I tried to show. Um, 
I know I'm sketchy, so the, there are two references here that, that, that one can look at and get more details. And the last thought that I want to say is that, of course, we all hope, that at some moment there will be a probabilistic theory available that, pro that would prove the honest central limit theorem for growing surfaces in 1 plus 1 and 2 plus 1, you know, anything. Hopefully, it's not going to take as long as 150 years as, the, as in, the, in the more case. But to me personally, this doesn't take much away from what I try to present, from the intrigue of what you get by taking something and carrying through the bridge, and by the inner beauty somehow of the, of the resultant subject. That's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening.